and me. As you noticed, today's kitchen will be Manx. The Isle of Man, also known as the Jewel in the Irish Sea, is situated between Ireland and Great Britain. It is a self-governing but dependent territory of the British Crown. It is also the first state in the world where women could vote for the national election as earliest as 1881. Of course, this right came with some restrictions. In particular, a woman eligible to vote had to own and hold properties or have a certain standing in the society. The country's head of state is Queen Elizabeth II, who holds the title of Lordess of Man. The British Queen is represented locally by a lieutenant governor. Foreign relations and defense of man are the responsibility of the British government. The capital is Douglas. The island has been inhabited since 6500 BC and the Gaelic influence has begun in the 5th century Anno Domini, together with the introduction of the Manx language, a branch of Gaelic. In the year 627 Anno Domini, Edwin of Northumbria conquered the island along with most of Mercia. In the 9th century, Norsemen established the Kingdom of Isles. Magnus III, the King of Norway, also known as the King of Man, has ruled the island between 1099 and 1103. In 1266, the island became part of Scotland by the Treaty of Perth, which liberated the island from Norway's possession. The island remained in British hands until 1313, when Robert the Bruce took it after besieging Castle Russian for five weeks. A hectic period followed when man was periodically under English and Scottish rules until 1346 when the Battle of Neville's Cross decided for England's favor. After a period of interim rules by the kings of Scotland and England, in 1399 the island came under the feudal lordship of the English crown. The lordship revested the British crown in 1765 and in 1866, man obtained a nominal measure of home rule. The island never became part of the United Kingdom and retained its status as an internally self-governing crown dependency. Today, the Isle of Man is home to about 86,000 people, of which 32% reside in Douglas, the capital, and 11% in the adjoining village of Anchen. The official language is English, but 2.4% of residents practice Manx as well. The Isle of Man is not part of the European Union, nor is today's Britain after the Brexit. You can visit this page for the updates on job permits and permanent residency requirements in Man. I can endlessly talk about this unique country under the flag of Triskelion and even have written a tour book in 2016. But you will agree that it's time to get to work. Today's appetizer is seared sea scallops and king oyster mushrooms, or simply queenies and trumpets. The entree is beef wellington, and the dessert is hazelnut butter taffy with cashews and dates. Country serving, serving in Killan, in a place they call New Hamilton. 
Seashells or scallops are the crown glory of the Manx cuisine. These are also named queenies. Large or medium-sized scallops are sustainably caught on the Isle of Man. Their shell can be of amber color or brown or russet, and the opaque or pearly meat inside the shell consists of a cylindrical muscle to which the roe is attached. The markets usually do not sell scallops with the roe. These scallops are incredibly versatile, used in so many dishes. It is always better to have freshly caught scallops, but the frozen and thawed quinis will work too. Use a paper towel to pat them dry because the wet scallops won't sear or brown in the pan. Frozen and thawed scallops have a bit more moisture, so take extra care when patting them dry. Dust each side with flour as the flour absorbs excess moisture and adds a nice golden brown crust. Use simple seasoning. I use black pepper, allspice and nutmeg. No salt. I sear the scallops in a preheated buttered pan, not iron cast like this, remember. Just a simple pan. If the scallops aren't sizzling when you fry them, then the pan is not hot enough. The scallops must be seared until golden brown on each side. Remove from the pan and continue working on the gravy. Add more butter or avocado, garlic oil like this, lemon zest, thyme, basil, a drop of balsamic vinegar, finally minced cabbage or Brussels sprouts, whatever you have. I also add fresh turmeric. If the glaze is too liquid, add half a teaspoon of flour. Then pour this majestic gravy on the quinis. Now we have to roast the king oyster mushrooms separately. Some glaze them with soy butter, but I like to keep things simple. I roast them in white wine. Here I added Chardonnay. King trumpets are meaty, nutty and flavorful. They do not generate too much liquid while being cooked. It's time to dress the plate. Sprinkle with finely chopped shallots and greens like parsley, cilantro, dill or mint. You can also dice the roasted queenies and trumpets and blend together into a smooth puree to spread your morning crackers with. Try and enjoy.
Beef Wellington is a steak dish of British origin made out of fillet steak coated with pate and duckles or duck sauce wrapped in puff pastry then baked. History of this dish is equally well worth celebrating as the dish itself. Wellington first was made to celebrate the victory of Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington, at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. A year prior to that, the Duke was decorated and highly ordained after defeating the one and only Napoleon Bonaparte. Although Wellington is not necessarily a Manx recipe, I included it in this episode because it is consummately British, so it is related. Over the process of making this dish, you will notice that there is a middle layer between beef and the pastry dough. In some recipes, it could be crepe or ham with duck sauce, diced and roasted mushrooms to retain the moisture and prevent it from making the pastry soggy. That's the point of the middle layer. Now the meat. I must confess that over the last two weeks, I simply could not find tenderloin or short loin, which is key to the classic Wellington recipe. I did not have time to visit many stores. Frankly, I was thinking of substituting with rabbit, but boning a rabbit to make a pate for Wellington is time consuming, so I am going to alter the rules and use this fine piece of Angus beef 9 inches to 5. It is not tenderloin, of course, but still it looks fine as it does not contain visible fascicles or perimysium. It may make a good Wellington. I only can hope at the moment. Before applying the seasoning, let's punch the meat so during the searing process the blood and serum will be drained out. Dry with a paper towel and spice it up. I use minimal seasoning for the Wellington. Just salt, freshly ground black pepper and freshly ground nutmeg. I don't recommend using iodized salt. Use kosher or sea salt. Sear all sides of the meat until well browned. Don't overcook as shortly after it will start a long journey in the oven. Thoroughly coat with Dijon mustard while the meat is hot to absorb the flavor and leave the meat to rest. Now let's make the duck sauce or the mushroom patty. Usually in Wellington, two types of mushrooms are used. I will only utilize king oyster pleurots for two reasons. Their rich, subtle, nutty taste that should not be overpowered by the other mushrooms and simply because king oysters do not generate too much moisture while being cooked. Using the residual liquid from the meat roast, I apply a bit of olive oil. I dice the mushrooms and roast them with finely chopped shallots, garlic and parsley. Remember, do not use greens that generate moisture such as celery, spinach, dill or verdolaga. The point of the middle layer is to keep the beef tender and meantime prevent the crust from becoming mushy or slushy. That's extra insurance. Use thyme and also parsley leaves, cutting the stems off, so later on the pieces of wellington will not be chewy. Add some alcohol, two shots of beer or whiskey, and cook the mushroom off the alcohol until all visible liquid is evaporated. 
If you don't, the mushrooms will continue to lose moisture when you're baking the wellington, which could lead to a soggy bottom. Leave the pate to chill for some 20 minutes. It's time for making the dough. Let me put on this apron, shall we? Some recommend crip, but I use a simple shaggy dough. One egg, salt. Warm water and all-purpose flour. The dough must be firm but non-sticky. I boil it and divide it into two parts for using one for the lattice cut and rolling the other into layered pastry dough or laminated dough or so-called burrage. I know what you are thinking now. Isn't it better to use a ready pastry dough from the stores? Yes, I agree, but I want to make my own dough. Now for the laminated half, I simply brush with olive oil, fold, then double fold, triple fold, and put the burrage to chill in the freezer for about 20 minutes. The dough is ready and let's roll it flat. Then cover the working surface with a plastic film overlapping so that it's twice the length and width of the meat. Sprinkle with flour to prevent the dough from sticking and place the laminated burrage on meat. Now let's work on the middle layer. I add beechwood smoked Italian ham on the layered dough you can either use speck or prosciutto. Here I use prosciutto. Then I add the duckles and spread them evenly. Next, I add ready layered flat mozzarella for extra insurance. <music> Lastly comes the beef itself. I wrap it all together with the dough in the outermost layer. I trim any extra pastry, then crimp edges with a fork to seal well. I twist the ends of plastic wrap to get a really tight cylinder. Then chill for 20 minutes. It's time to work on the lattice cover. Not to see them, and I, pour the milk. 
I used the remaining piece of the pastry bowl which wasn't laminated. I cut with lattice hedge to make that famous net effect. I take the wrap from the freezer, egg wash thoroughly. Then wrap it with the lettuce layer. One more egg wash. I sprinkle with sesame seeds I put the log in the preheated oven 425 degrees Fahrenheit until the pastry is golden brown and the center registers 120 Fahrenheit for medium rare. Then I put it to rest for 10 minutes before carving and serving. Shall we cut it now? I am a bit nervous. Here we go. We got this nice rare medium grilled Angus beef and I make no excuses for using it instead of tenderloin. For the sides to the Wellington, I suggest fresh or pickled produce such as sauerkraut, pickled olives with red pepperazzi, or simply fresh cucumber and tomato salad. As a general rule, per each episode, I present a few pieces from my vast solid silverware collection, not silver plated, all from solid silver. The new piece I have purchased recently is this gorgeous magnifier glass with a 38 gram handle from solid silver, which I am going to use for magnifying the British silver marks on my other items. To show the marks on the current item, I will use my usual magnifier. So this one was made in 1903 during the Edwardian period in Sheffield's office as indicative by the crown mark corresponding to Sheffield. The date letter is small l, linking the year 1903, and the makers are B and M for Berthold Muller, a German silversmith who exported Neresheimer silver from Hanau to England. Now, as you recall, I used this fancy creamer when I was layering the dough for Wellington. This was made in London in 1912, and the proof for it is the date letter small r in italic corresponding to 1912. The town mark Leo stands for London. The purity mark is Lion Passant for sterling silver. 
The makers are Allen and Darwin, for Charles James Allen and Sidney Darwin, who indeed were British silversmiths mastering in London until 1914 and in Sheffield's office until 1928. The experts are welcome to check my statements. Next, I use this Taza bowl for the egg wash. It is from solid sterling silver dating 1903, the Edwardian time. The standard mark indicates sterling purity per thousand. The town mark is Leo for London. Date letter is small h. As shown in the catalog, it was made in 1903 because this ball is not marked by a duty mark. The 1823 and 1883 marks contain the monarch's duty marks that discontinued in about 1890. The makers are Sibray, Hall and Company. Further, the date letter H is fancier in the two other marks, in Castellar and Harrington fonts correspondingly. Some of you are already curious of my passion for silverware. I do have serious gold jewelry, however I also love silver, because working on silver is harder than on gold. Silver has a gravity of 10.5 grams per cubic centimeters and the gold's gravity is 19.32 grams per cubic centimeters. Further, the melting point of silver is 1763 Fahrenheit, which converts to about 962 Celsius, which is almost 200 Fahrenheit below that of gold, as the gold's melting point is 1948 Fahrenheit or 1064 Celsius. Thus, when valuing an item, silver or gold, I appreciate the difficulties that the master may have faced. Hazelnut butter or Nutella are morning routines, yet we can also turn those into fudge bars. What I like about this dessert is that it doesn't need any laborious preparation or even baking. Fudge is an American invention that first emerged in 1800. The monks or the British have an alternative named toffee which is similar to what I'm going to prepare and that is why I included it in the current episode. Toffee was originated in the United Kingdom in 1825. The main difference between the British and American toffee is that English toffee is plain, it doesn't contain nuts, whereas the American toffee comes with a variety of nuts. The most common is almond. Californian toffee usually is with walnuts. Today I'm making something unique. I'm going to add dates and cashews, but after I roast and half the cashews as these guys are raw and super fresh. For the mix, I'm using this terracotta color hazelnut butter spray. Each jar weighs 320 grams, so the total is 640 grams of spray. I will not add any milk or condensed milk, as this spray already contains milk. I am adding melted butter. Two bars, I guess. Vanilla. And sugar powder, or confectioner's sugar. And stirring until the powder is incorporated into the batter. I dice the dates.
then roast then half the cashews cool them and mix all together I spread the batter into the baking pan and smooth it with a rubber spatula. Then I cool it in the refrigerator for about one hour. After, I sprinkle it with sea salt flakes for balancing the taste. These are not cheap, I must tell you. I was lucky to find this 760 gram jar from Spain under $13. What's funny is the assurance. See the date? These flakes are good until November of 2031. I hope to overleave this salt. Just joking. Now it's time to cut the toffee. The sizes of the cuts may vary. I cut it into 2 inch squares. Let's try. Mmm. Delectable. And these are the dates truffles that my son Richard has made last week from mashed dates mixed with thick coconut cream, chocolate powder and coated by oatmeal flour, caramel and minced cashews. Simple but elegant. Moran Ting Erson Cohen Head. Thanks for watching.